whatever it looks like, whatever it feels like, we say yes to you tonight, Jesus. The mountain or the valley, the good, the bad, happy, the sad, we give you our souls like Jesus prayed, into your hands, I commit my spirit, Father. I am yours. Sing this bridge with me one last time. I won't bow real low. And see, I won't bow to idols. I'll stand strong and worship you. If it puts me through the fire, I'll rejoice because you're there too. And I won't be for my feelings. I hold fast to what is true. If the cross brings transformation, you can hang me there with you. Cause death is just a doorway into resurrection life. If I join you in the suffering, then I'll join you when you rise. And when you return in glory, with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing. Come on, one last time. I won't bow. Say, I won't bow. Welcome to Anchor Church this morning. A little bit of picture commotion going on. If you're tuning in on Facebook, welcome. On YouTube, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Didn't even have to ask your way to stand. Look at that. I'm excited to... I missed last week, so I'm excited to be here. I know our pastor's excited to bring the word this morning. He hasn't sat down since he walked in the building. Which is awesome because he's got a new hit. Father, we just welcome you in this place. And we thank you for your goodness, your kindness. We come into this building today full of thanksgiving. Not just because we had a holiday of thanksgiving, but we, because of what you do for us. Because of in every season, in every moment, you're so good. 
we praise you because you're good. We praise you because you turn beauty from ashes and you turn, take our sorrow and you turn it into joy. You take our, our sadness and you turn it into gladness. Father, thank you for what you do. We praise you. We praise you and we worship you for who you are today. We sing praises to you for who you are today. In Jesus' name, we expect mighty things today.
deserving of it all. He's deserving of it all. We praise your name today, Jesus. We can't hold back our song to you. Our praise to you. Sing, I can't hold back. songs as we're singing this morning, they really say who God is to us. And I really like that because sometimes it's good to just have a reminder that we worship the God who was, who is, who ever will be the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. He's so faithful. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who always makes ways for us when there seems to be no way. We used to be beggars, but now we're royalty. We just worship you today, Father. And we 
won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We'll shout out. Shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out. One more time. We were the beggars. Now we royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we run him free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were. We were the beggars. Shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There is joy in the house of the Lord. There is joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We'll shout out. Shout out your praise. Oh, we praise your name. We shout out your praise. Jesus, we worship you today. Thank you that we were beggars, but now we're royalty. We're seated with you in heavenly places. Thank you that we're no longer prisoners, but we're free in you, Jesus. More people need to be excited about that. We're free in Jesus today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, that you've given us so many reasons to praise your name, so many reasons to worship you. We just lift our voices to you today, Jesus, and worship you. When I'm at my end, you're just getting started. When I hear the war, you just walk through when I face a mountain you are the maker 
so it's got to move. When I'm out of faith, you are still faithful. When I'm at my worst, you are still good. And all of my questions, you are the answer. It all points to When I'm breaking down, you'll be working a way through. When there's no way out, this one thing I know, you're still on your throne. So whatever I'm feeling, I still got a reason to praise, praise, praise. And out of story and out of the cross come rivers of grace and out of the grave births of revival no two can contain you're the god of the breakthrough when i'm breaking down you'll be working a way through when there's no way out this one thing I know, you're still on your throne. So whatever I'm feeling, I still got a reason to praise. And praise, praise. I still got a reason to praise. Praise, praise. To life, deserts, to paradise, stones just are rolling away. When you come around, my heart starts to beat again. Long stretch to breathe you in, souls just erupt into praise. Cause when you come around, dry bones come to life, deserts, to paradise. To breathe you in, souls to steer up into praise. You're the God of the breakthrough. When I'm breaking down, you'll be working a way through. When there's no way out, this one thing I know, you're still on your throne. So whatever I feel. This song has been such an anthem in my life recently because it, going through dry periods, going through hard times, is just really difficult sometimes to just focus in on what Jesus wants to do in your life and a reason to worship. And sometimes you get up and you don't feel like it. Sometimes you get up and you're weary, you're tired. You maybe didn't sleep last night. You woke up and you're not feeling well. But this song 
Every day I put it on in the morning, and I'm like, man, I got to choose. David chose. Zach Troutwine chooses every day to worship. So one more time, can we just sing this? Just together, choose with me this morning that dry bones come to life, deserts to paradise, that stones, my stones, your stones, roll away, your sickness is healed in Jesus' name. Dry bones come to life, deserts to paradise, stones to star roll it away. When you come around, my heart starts to beat again, lung stretch to breathe you in, stones to steer up to praise. When you come around, dry bones come to life, deserts to paradise, stones to star. To breathe you in, souls just erupted to pray. You're the God of the breakthrough. When I'm breaking down, you be working a way through. When there's no way out, this one thing I know, you're still on your throne. So whatever I'm feeling, I still got a reason to praise. Good morning. Thank you. Okay, there will be refuel this Wednesday at 7 p.m. That includes Tribe, and Clubhouse is going to start practicing, um, I think, this week. Yes. All right. Um, also, Wednesday, um, the 15th. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't think of the, the date. Um, the Clubhouse and Legacy are going to be doing gingerbread house making. Huh? That sounds so fun. Tis the season, right? Okay. Um, also in December, the following Wednesday, the 22nd, we're going to have a Christmas candlelight. Is this really loud for some reason? Um, sorry about that. Christmas candlelight communion service at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, December 22nd. And I forgot to bring that um, bag right there. We have our first bag. I think I'm so excited. Okay, sleeping bag drive. Thank you, Boyards, uh, for bringing that in. Um, the first bag, but we're hoping to get many more. But anyway, but next Sunday, we'll be um, taking those up. will be our last Sunday, and then I'm going to deliver them to the homeless of Morgantown. And um, just, you know, they don't have to be crazy, crazy expensive. We just want them to be, you know, get them a warm one. Um, they are expensive so you know just pray over it and bless it and we pray that it will bless them tremendously okay. sorry about that january 2nd pastor mike will be sharing the vision of 2022 so you don't want to miss that january 2nd it will be here before we know it so mark it on your calendar oh thank you you're so sweet i love her that's service. That's service. And we have some people who are serving also, um, some legacy students that are serving today. And everyone looks so beautiful in their black and white anchor shirts today. So I think Pastor Sandy's coming up. Good morning. I just want to give you an update on our missions. Do we have our photo? I want to introduce you to the little girl that you're sponsoring in the Philippines. Her name is Sheena Barbin. Isn't she sweet? You're blessed in this little girl. Every time you give to missions, we're sponsoring um, a girl in the Philippines. And I think on our card, I forgot to bring it with me. But I think on our card, they asked her what she wanted. And all she wanted was food, family, and protection. That was her request. So... You are meeting her needs by giving to missions. So we support Eric Miller and their family who um, have been missionaries to the Philippines for, I believe, 17 years. 
and now they're in the United States, but um, during their stay here in the United States, they've been traveling across the nation, spreading the gospel and bringing awareness to this country. Also in the Philippines, um, they had, I guess, 20 buildings that burnt down in the Philippines. So our sponsoring, Eric Miller and them, are spreading the gospel there, but it's also helping to rebuild these homes that have been destroyed um, by fire. Also, Generation Impact, which you all know, Keith Collins and Darla, they are networking um, ministries to assist spreading the gospel across the nation also. And he's also now just been added as an adjunct teacher to um, Daniel Kalende, Christ for, all, Christ for Nations. And so he's equipping and uh, leading leaders to um, take the gospel to the world. So again, your missions go to that. And got a great update from Chestnut Mountain Ranch, which is the ranch in Morgantown, West Virginia, led by um, Steve and Donna Finn. They just received a $350,000 challenge. If they meet, it's dollar to dollar, so if they meet dollar to dollar, they will be given $350,000 to start the fourth boys home at Chestnut Mountain Ranch. Isn't that great? So um, if you don't know who they are, what they do, you can go online and look at that. But basically, they're a Christ-centered school. Um, it's a home for boys that's in crisis and need, and they give them, pardon me, and Zach taught there for a year, I believe it was, two years. Okay, two years. And actually, we're going to go to their open house here in a couple weeks, but um if you want to give to that specifically to match that $350,000 uh, um, need, mark that on your missions um, envelope as well. Um, they also, I am so excited to be talking to him about this. He has been working on a foster initiative. I don't know how many of you are aware of foster um, you know, what happens in the foster system, but we've experienced it firsthand, and it's a very unstable system. And um, he has been working really hard to reform the foster system, so I'm excited to hear what is happening um, concerning the foster initiative. And also, priority evangelism we support. Um, you all know Ken and Sonia Pounders. They are reaching the world with the gospel. We support them in um, Nicaragua. Um, Anna usually does a suitcase project for them for Christmas, helps lead that. But we also support them. They have a Christ-centered rehabilitation center for addicts, for men. And I'll tell you what, he has one of the best programs that we have ever seen. So I just wanted to encourage you today um, and give you an update on missions. So here comes Mr. Marty McCabe. Hey everybody, how we doing? Is everybody ready for your first blessed bomb? Oh. So I'm gonna try and bring a blessed bomb to you uh, every week inspired by real stories or also I'm gonna use them out of this book called The Blessed Life, Unlocking the Rewards of Generous Giving by Robert Morris. Uh, we did a class on this book two or three years ago and it's absolutely awesome. Um, first story, I, I just heard a story the other day about um, a guy had, he wanted to bless somebody and he went and um, like the, the person he blessed had just bought a home and he is using coal for heat and he didn't, like, he didn't have his coal yet, it was on a layaway at a store and the guy went and paid off his layaway and delivered three pallets of coal to him, stacked it on his porch where he normally stacks it. And he, he said that the guy that had just bought the house and received that blessing had like just bought the house. So there's all these things that come up and he had a pellet stove also and the pellet stove went on the fritz and he had to order like a $500 part for that. So the timing of it all was so perfect that the coal came in at the right time, and that's just totally God. God's timing is always perfect. So that's living a blessed life to bless others is, that's your first blessed bomb. 
Now, uh, church funds, we are at 145, 836, and 84 cents, and left only to get to 200 is 54,163 and 16 cents. So we are getting there. That's awesome. And if anybody knows a business that needs a write off for the end of the year, um, you know, maybe plug that a little bit. No, do what you got to do. Uh, we're going to make this happen before March 6th. That's our groundbreaking. Um, so we're going to pray in all those. And I want everybody to be blessed with what you're giving today. Remember, we're any little extra pennies or nickels or dimes that are in your pocket. Put them in that missions envelope so we can bless all of our missions. And uh, make sure you're marking on your envelopes a tithe or building fund. Uh, that way the money goes to the appropriate um, account. So Jesus, thank you very much for the cheerful givers that are in this house. And uh, as they give and tithe, they receive uh, blessings as well, and they are tenfold back out. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Sometimes we get up and we, we're in a mood. How many have ever been in a mood? You think God's in your mood? I see some people looking at other people. That you live, don't look at people you live with. Just how, how many ever wake up and you're in a mood? <laughs> this is my mic's echoing, I believe. But anyhow, you know we can we can be in a mood. We think God's in my mood. You know, so we're, I'm just gonna be in a bad mood today. But that's not it. God's always saying there's an upward call. God, you know, He's calling us to come up higher. Zach, you inspired me to share, like, I was like, not going to share this, and then you shared what you shared, and I was going to share this, but, you know, um, I, I just, I got to, I, I just want to thank everybody that ministered to my dad, you know, Billy and Linda would send my dad cards all the time, but I was, we was cleaning out his stuff, and I was looking through his cards, and he never saved one birthday card for me, but he saved every Father's Day card, and the Lord started to speak to me through that, that Every, every man has within him to be a father because of our Heavenly Father. Like, we desire that. We, we, we want that. But I was thinking how, how that in him is the same way as God is with our prayers. Do you know he saves everyone? And he doesn't just save it, he acts on it. And the book of Revelation says that there's going to be a time. How many of you ever read in the book of Revelation where it says there's going to be silence in heaven for a half hour? And you know, at the end of all things, at the consummation of all things, the Bible says that there's going to, for a half hour, there's going to be silence in heaven. And then the, the crescendo, just, just imagine the 4th of July fireworks, all the prayers of all the saints are going to be released. Like big fireworks, like every prayer, just think about it, every prayer you ever prayed, God saves it and he moves on it. 
even long after we forget about it, he moves on. He, he, he's, still, he, he's still working. You know, sometimes things take so long, and we don't know why they take so long. Are you with me? You know, Abraham got this great promise, and then, then God waited until Abraham could no longer do it in himself to give him a child. He just, he just waited until there, no, there was no possible way Abraham could do it, but God did it. And, you know, we get, we get people go through so much um, this time of year. How, how many of you know, but it's all the time. People's going through stuff. We have no idea what they're going through. Some people can be smiling in life at the party and inside they're hurting. But our father is such a good father that he's, he's like my dad. He saves every word that we speak to him. Amen. He saves every word that we speak to him. And it's so amazing. I, I, some of you know this story and some of you don't. I feel like I'm supposed to share it maybe for somebody here or somebody online. But, you know, deer season comes around every year. It's a special time to me. And it's not because... I go hunting anymore because uh, my last hunting, I ended up almost dying afterwards with my appendix bursting, but I haven't hunted since. But I've got this deer mounted on my wall, and it reminds me of the goodness of my father. When I was a kid, I'm just going to share you a story about how God will restore your life. He'll give you life. When I was a kid, I, I got into alcohol and drugs and my parents have bought, I always wanted to go deer hunting, and my parents bought me this gun when I was 12 years old, and I got, I got running wild, and I needed money one Friday night, and I sold this, this deer rifle that they got me, and um, just for money, for, for whatever, probably, you know, just partying, but uh, I sold this gun, but when I did, it, it's like I felt shame and guilt, because I knew what they had to go through to buy me that gun, and so... After I'm saved, you know, you know why I always preach it's, it's never too late to have a happy childhood? Because after I got saved, God began to, to work on me, but the devil still would speak in my ear. You should have shame and guilt for some of the stuff you've done. And selling that gun was one of the things that I had shame and guilt from. And so, so fast forward, <laughs> my 38th birthday, um, my dad had never bought me a present before. And, and my mom did all the shopping. She took care of all that stuff. You know, dad just shelled out the money. How many of you understand what, how, what that's like? But anyhow, he never personally bought me a gift. And so, so on my 38th birthday, my mom had Alzheimer's. She could no longer do that. So my dad took up that task. So he called me and he said, um, do you want your birthday gift? And I said, uh, no, I'll just wait. I'll just wait till tomorrow. He said, no, I want you to come down to my house. I want, I want to give you something. So I said, okay. So I, I didn't know what it would be. Um, but so I went down and I, I uh, walked in the door and I sat down at the table, got a cup of coffee. My dad comes out with this towel. And he said, uh, here, here's your gift. Pull the towel off. I pulled the towel off and here was this deer rifle. And he said, uh, he said, when you was a kid, my dad, who his dad left him, my dad, uh, you know, left us. He never, he never did anything but hunt and drink. And he said, that's why I hated hunting, never took you hunting. And he said, but this gun, I sold it when you were born. And uh, I told the guy if I ever wanted it back, would he sell it to me? And he said, yeah, and that was 38 years ago. <laughs> and so my dad, he said, something, something just told me I was supposed to go buy this gift for you, buy this gun back and give it to you for your birthday. And when he did, when he gave it to me, it was like God wiped all the shame and all the guilt off of me because my dad went and bought that gun back after 38 years. I mean, can you imagine a guy having a gun 38 years? He said, I was going to give it to my grandkids. And my dad said, tough. You told me <laughs> you'd sell back to me if I wanted. And when he, when he did, it was like all... Oh, from, from the alcohol and the drugs and everything I did, it was like God just wiped away the shame because he's a good God. And so that's not the end of the story. So, so deer season comes, and I, I shot this gun, sighted it in, and I took it hunting. And I fasted three days. I was on a three-day fast, and I was praying. And the Lord spoke to my heart, and he said, I'm going to take you. I'm going I'm to have a divine appointment for you in the woods this Saturday. So I figure I'm going to meet some hunter that needs to hear about Jesus. 
So I went hunting with about, I don't know, eight or ten guys, and we prayed before we went hunting in the morning. And, and so I went down, and I, I crossed this stream clear up in the mountain. Uh, and and uh, I, went, I went and I sat down in the dark right by this tree. And as soon as I did, and, and this is another thing, I'd never killed a buck before that. As soon as, I, as soon as it got daylight, this big eight point just walks down and right in front of me. And it was, like, it was like inside I heard the Lord saying, this is your day, son. And so I, now, for all you, uh, don't nobody send me any emails about shooting deer or anything. But anyhow, I, I pulled up that gun and just, just, I'd only ever shot it one time. I just pulled up a gun and shot that deer. And, you know, it went down. And I sat there in the woods and I was crying and praising God. And he was just restoring my childhood. And, and, and I felt like the Lord said, you know, your dad never got to take you hunting, but today I did. Because he's a good God. And, and, and I'm telling you, I don't know how God can write that story for you or how God, I couldn't have told, I couldn't have wrote that story. Only God in his faithfulness, he, he, he didn't want the devil beating me up with shame and guilt. So I don't know who that's for today, but I can just tell you, it's never too late to have a happy childhood. God will erase the shame and the guilt of your past. And I hear so many people just, just, you can hear it in their voice, man. They're just caught up in what they've done. But listen to me, God has a future and a hope for you, the Bible says. That's, he has a future and a hope, and he'll, he'll restore it to you. I want to tell you, I, I told every, I had to drag that deer across the creek. Up, I, everybody was helping me drag that deer, but every hunter we met in the woods was crying. I told them the story. I'm serious. All these big guys, 30 out sixes, everybody's got guns. They're all crying when I tell them the story. Why? Because they have that same thing in their heart that I have, that same void without God that I had. And God, God will restore to you the years that the canker worm has eaten. Don't give up. Because he'll restore years of your life back to you. And sometimes when you need to know, hey, am I doing a good job? God sends you a message through people. Amen. I believe I was sending my dad a message through those cards that I had no idea I was sending them. But my dad wasn't the type of person to keep cards, but he kept them because I think God was restoring something to him from his childhood. And so don't ever underestimate the little thing you can do for somebody to make a huge difference. Amen. Like sending a card. Amen. Isn't that good? Like, don't you want that for everybody? Don't you want that for your kids? I want this for people that's, that's lonely and people that's orphaned and people that's addicted and people that's messed up a lot. Maybe you never messed up a lot, but you're a sinner. Sinner's a sinner, right? You've lied. Maybe you've, maybe you've never been an addict, but maybe you've lied or maybe you've you know, hurt people. Maybe you've not forgiven people, maybe whatever. But we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? God, God wants to restore you today. He's a good God. Say it. He's a good God. God is a good God. Don't give up. 38 years, if I had to give up in there, I never got to see that thing happen. There's things that I'm seeing that after it's too late for you to do it, many times God will do it. He can still restore. Amen. Don't give up on your family either. Don't give up on your friends. Don't give up on people coming to God. They can be the meanest atheists, agnostic, give you a hard time. But, man, God can get them. Amen. God can get them. He got you. Whatever you were like, he got you. He got a winner when he got you. Amen. Because he's a good God. And it's not over. It doesn't matter how old you are. It's not over. If I never, listen, I see all these big bucks being killed, and I think, wow, man. But that one to me that I got, I'll never mount another. I don't need another deer. <laughs> I got the one I needed, you know, and that's it. That's just it. It's, it. God will put trophies in your case. Amen. That might seem, there might be some people who totally don't understand that. But to me, I remind myself when I look at that deer. How many get in a trial and you can't remember anything God's did for you? How many say, this ain't working? Get in a trial, this ain't working. Tell me something God did for you, good. And you're in a trial and you're like, um, I know he's done stuff, but I just can't think of none right now. Because the enemy tries to wipe that out of your mind. But he's a good God. He's a good God. Amen? Thank you, Zach. I don't know what I'll preach now, but that's my message one. Amen? It might be the most important message. 
talking about getting in rhythm with God. If you weren't here, how many was not here last week? I'll do a little review. Getting in rhythm with God, the thing that I saw, and I didn't have Zach do it. I don't have jump rope this morning, so you're off the hook. But the thing that, the thing that I saw in getting in rhythm with God is how many is good at jumping rope? How many can still jump a rope? About five, ten people. Good. Okay, now I might hold you to it. All right. You're, you're good at, if you're good at jumping a rope, you get in rhythm. You get in rhythm, and once you get in rhythm, you just go. You just jump. But the, the picture I saw is, remember when you were kids and one kid would hold a rope on one side and one the other, and they'd try to, I think they'd intentionally try to trip you, you know? How many had that experience? It's kind of like when they jump off the seesaw, you know? Did you ever have that experience? If you were on the husky side like me, that hurt, all right? But anyhow, when I talk about getting in rhythm with God, I'm talking about him holding the rope and us jumping. Like, we're not holding the rope. God's holding the rope, and he's jumping, and we get in rhythm with God. And then I got this, this verse in uh, Matthew 11. I'm going to go to Matthew 11, 28 to 30 in the message, just a little review. This is my main text for this, this scripture. <clears throat> get all choked up about that story. It, it, Matthew 11, uh, 28 to 30, and I'm going to go a little fast through this just to review to get to the message. But he said, are you tired? Are you worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Don't you want that? Don't you want to live freely and lightly? Amen. I do. I want to live every day freely and lightly, not, not having to work at it so hard. I want to be in rhythm with God so I don't have to work at it so hard. Can I tell you, self is the hard way. The Bible says, Proverbs 14 and 12, there's a way that seems right to man. The end of that way is death. But God's ways are easy. Amen. His ways, are, his ways are, 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 are light. I pray that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. You know, we had a great communion last Sunday, but I know the Lord wasn't finished with, with all this. You know, I was praying about what we, we try to outreach locally, regionally, nationally, internationally. That's what the Bible says in Acts. That what, that's what we should do. We should, we should have a world vision, an international vision. That's what we try to do with our outreaches. And I was just sitting there thinking, you know, this week, what can we do to just reach out to our kids here um, for Christmas, and I just sense the Lord saying, you know, just use what's in your hand. Well, we got a popcorn machine, we can do a movie, and so I got this idea that we're going to, the Grinch is going to get saved, he's going to be here on, on uh, we're going to have the Grinch come on, on uh, the 17th of December, and uh, he's going to come, and, and, and you know, you can just take something just as little as that, and God can use that to touch people's hearts. How many of you know the Grinch's heart changes at the end? Well, to me, he's born again, okay? So, <laughs> So we're going to have, the Grinch is going to come here and visit our kids, but just that, that idea was easy. I was just like, God, that's easy. Why do I struggle so many times getting ideas for stuff when God, you're, you're the God of all ideas. And I tell you, he wants to give you those ideas for your life. I've been praying every business in here. I've been praying over every business and every person trying, wanting to change jobs and all that that's told me that you'd have witty inventions and new ideas for this year. Proverbs 18, 11 says, God would give us witty inventions. Aren't you tired of Apple making all the money and Zuckerberg making all the money and all these other people making all the money? It's time the money's in the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Our kids get those witty inventions and new ideas, those, those one ideas that can change everything. That's what God wants us to have. Open our minds. It's get in rhythm with him. Get his ideas. Amen. What's the, is it Marie Collender makes the pies? She wants to start in her house, right? She started making some pies on the side. Now she's in every, every freezer section. You know what I mean? There's people that, that God has used just with, just with a little idea. Marty likes pie. There's, there's people with it. He's over there shouting about the pie in the corner. You know, see, that's good. See, how many knows that you can do something with your life that it can be small, but it's worthy of worship? I watch some people plow a field. And I used to help plow some fields when I was a kid. And I watched some people plow, and it's an art. They do it right. They keep it straight. Everything's good. They do it. 
it's worthy of worship. Sometimes I get a coffee and I think, that's, that's just praise Jesus. That's good coffee. It's, it's, it, there's things that we can do that are so small with excellence that are, that are things of beauty. Amen? That people wonder where we get that kind of talent from. The, you know, I said last time, the enemy in our own flesh will try to resist us from being in rhythm with God. Our own flesh. And a lot of what gears our own flesh is fear. Fear wants to keep us in a comfort zone. It'd be like if I said today, okay, we're all going to go to, we're not just going to feed this girl in the Philippines, we're all going. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, I can't go. You know, that'd be a lot of people's first response. I, when I come up with ideas, can I tell you something? Like Keith Collins said, my leg gets better, look out. But listen, you, uh, you got to understand, I don't, I don't like coming out of my comfort zone any more than you do, but I know that you can't grow without it. If our faith gets stagnant and stale and we're not growing, something's wrong. We're supposed to grow until we die. We're supposed to, we're supposed to live until we die. We're not supposed to at some point just shut down. I don't believe that. I believe we should go shutting down. My dad, I, I like the way that he went, you know, even though it was hard, I like he had his last cup of coffee on it in his hand and he went. He was moving into another day, right? And he went on. He, he wasn't... He wasn't just sitting right back waiting for the day. He was moving. Just bought a new car. He's just, he's moving ahead. And that's the way I want to be with my life. I want to live like that. And we need to live in rhythm with God. He's moving. But he'll, you got to say yes to coming out of your comfort zone. This is nothing what I wrote down today. None of this. So, but anyhow, we got we to gotta be willing to get out of our comfort zone. Me, you, everybody. We do. We do. Say, we do. We need to get out of it. Our, our flesh will hold us back. That's not the enemy. That's our flesh. Getting in rhythm with God is getting back in faith, back in the flow of God. Last week, we dealt with, the, with resist. Submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Resist. Stiff arm him. Stiff arm him. Stiff arm disease and sickness. Stiff arm him. Knock it down. Amen. You know, we submit to God, we resist. To, I said the one thing the Lord taught me back in, uh, through, through everything that I went through um, with, with uh, being crazy was when you're, when you're an addict, you learn to rest and roll over, but you don't learn to resist. And you got to resist the devil. You got to resist temptation. You have to resist it. Temptation will come. We got to resist it. We've got to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Don't just roll over. Stand up and resist today. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 and 9. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 and 9. It says, be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Be vigilant means to be on guard, not live in fear. You know what I believe COVID has tried to do to our world is to get everybody to live in fear instead of being on guard and moving. There's a difference between being on guard, knowing there's an enemy. It's like a battalion out in war. There's a difference between being on guard and moving and being on fear and setting still. We can't do anything. We can't. This isn't the time to do anything. This isn't the time to build onto the church. This isn't the time to move ahead. This isn't the time to invest more. This isn't the time to harvest. Amen? We've got to, listen, there's a time that you got you to gotta, uh, quit cutting bait and you got to fish. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> How many grew up with that saying? You're going you to cut bait, you're going to fish. It's time that the church fishes. It's time we harvest. We've got to quit cutting bait. The last thing we want to do is be putting in fence posts when it's time to harvest. Nobody does that. That'd be a stupid farmer. You're going to go bankrupt if you're a farmer and you're putting in fence posts when you're supposed to be harvesting. You don't want to be fixing fence, then. You want to be harvesting because you only got so long to harvest. Jesus is coming, and we only got so long to harvest. 
We only got so long to tell our story to other people to see him come to Jesus. Wednesday night, we're going to work on our testimony again, sharing our testimony. A young man that was uh, bound by addiction wants to come and share a little bit of his testimony on Wednesday night again. We, last, last week, Shannon shared his testimony on Wednesday, or week before last on Wednesday, Shannon shared part of his testimony. We're going to learn how to share our testimony because people need to hear our story because it's harvest time. I'm hearing from the Lord. I don't believe that things are going to get better all of a sudden in our world. I believe that the church is going to get greater and brighter, and we're going to learn it's harvest time. We're going to share our story for God's glory, and it's going to make an impact on people. Amen. Whew, I get excited about that. But we got to be on guard not live in fear. Don't let your family make you live in fear. We can't live in fear. I know COVID's real. I know we take it serious. I know we need to take all the precautions. I know we still need to wash our hands. I know there's people dying from it. There's people that's living through it too. There's people that's living through cancer. There's people that's dying with cancer. There's tragedy all around us. There's people lonely. There's people committing suicide. There's all kind of this stuff going on in our whole world. What do they need? Jesus. They need, he wants his church to be in rhythm with him. It might just be writing a card. You don't know what you did writing a card to my dad. You don't know what you do writing a card to somebody. That's not hard, is it? You don't know what get, taking a phone call or, or sending a text to somebody can do, but it can do a lot for somebody. Just a little thing. There's a man, God put him on my heart on Monday. I don't know this man. I only know of him. He sent us a message here on live stream, and I, I know God put, put him on my heart that day, and I said, you're on my heart. How many know it feels weird? I mean, I'm thinking he's going to think I'm another quack preacher, you know, or whatever. But I just took the chance, and I said, you know what? You're on my heart. I was praying, and I've learned with my life, when somebody's on my heart, reach out. So that's what I'm doing. You know, and immediately, I got a message back. Immediately. So, hey, I know that God, He gets us out of our comfort zone to do little things that can make a big difference. Little things that can make a big difference. Be vigilant. Say, be vigilant. Be on guard, but don't be in fear. You know, God's moving. Satan wants to access us, and most times he does it by our mind. Y'all with me? The Bible, the Bible says, uh, shows us that Satan, uh, the devil, he's a, he's a master of disguise. He disguised himself. He can come as an angel of light. He disguised himself through Scripture with Jesus. He did. He used Scripture on Jesus. Can you imagine? What a devil. He tries to use the Word on the Word. And he does. He'll use what you think you're strong in and come at you. Why? Because he's an intimidator. He uses fear and intimidation. Huh? How many ever played sports where, where the people talk smack? Anybody ever played football and the people across from you talk smack? They, 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 they talk a lot of stuff like, yeah, I'm going to, yeah, I'm whatever. And you, mm -hmm, yeah, that ain't happening. Right? You, you, you understand that people try to intimidate until you confront. And that's what the devil does. He tries to intimidate you until you confront. You submit to God. You resist the devil. And he has to flee. That's scriptural. He has to flee. He has to run as in terror. It says, your adversary. That word adversary means prosecutor. He comes like a lawyer to bring charges against us. Stuff from your past. Mike, you got to have shame all your life. Mike, you got to be ashamed for what you did. Your, your brother and sister didn't do that. Mike, why did you do that? Mike, you got to have shame the rest of your life. You need to, you need to walk 10 paces behind everybody, Mike, because you're no good. Anybody ever lived there? He, he'll, he'll make you be behind. You're not as good as other people. You're, you, you can't measure up to the people in your family. I don't, I, why are you such a misfit? That's what the enemy will try to do. And listen, we can, we can look around us today and everybody in here, and I'll tell you what, there's people feeling those feelings, and we think, that's the last person I ever thought would feel like that. But it's true. But God's a good God. Right? How many know he's just a lawyer? We got a judge <laughs> that's on our side. And we can go into his inner chambers. And, and listen, it's a done deal. Before it ever goes to court. 
We win. Just don't stay in a court that's not your court battle. You know, he says, uh, why would God do anything for you? Why do you think God should do anything for you? You just keep messing up. Why should God do anything for you? You're a failure. You don't have victory. Does it feel like you have victory today? That's the way he comes. He's, a, he's an adversary. He's adversarial to us. The, the word devil, I shared this last time, the devil is a job description, not a name. It's the strike again and again and again at our mind until he gets through. Just like pounding on a piece of drywall. Now, I know some of you can punch straight through a piece of drywall, but you won't if there's a two-before behind it. But anyhow, uh, if you look at my hands, you can see I've done both. But you can, you can the, the devil comes at your mind, and he comes, and he wants you ticked off at everybody in the church. He wants you to feel offended. He wants you to feel like you're worthless. He wants you to feel like you're no good, that you don't need God, that you don't need the church, that nobody wants you anyhow, that, that God doesn't want you anyhow, that you're a mess up, and you're just going to mess up again. And he pounds, and he pounds, and when he finds a weak spot, he goes for it. But when you know how to submit to God and resist the devil, he will flee. That's why I'm still free of addiction to this day is because I know that God taught me, Jeff, how to resist. And I'm still resisting. A spirit of infirmity can come after you after you're healed. Try to make you sick every Sunday. Spirit of infirmity can come against you after you've been healed because of some little stray little imp that's assigned to you. Huh? Some little stray imp that has no home thinks he's going to use you. And you need to stop letting him do it. Say, I submit to God. I resist you, devil. you got to run. I remember Smith Wigglesworth uh, telling the story of he was using this scripture and trying to get this lady to understand it. And he said, he, back in the days when, when he was in the city and he rode a bus, he said there was a lady that, that worked at the restaurant he went to and her little dog would, would follow her to, to the bus every day. And, and she would say, now, now, now go home, boy. Now go home. And dog would just sit there, you know. That's what my dog does. I got to admit, I don't like yelling at my dog. She has no problem. I, I, I just don't like yelling at my dog. I mean, I just make, I don't know, I guess we've gotten close over the last two years. But, like, I don't like yelling at her. But you know what? If they're going to get in trouble, you got to yell. And so he said, she would wait every day until the bus came. When the bus came up there and she knew the dog was going to get run over, she said, now you get home. See, that dog would just turn tail and run home. And I think sometimes we just think, oh, my gosh. You know, this, this things that come at us, sometimes we think we deserve them. These things, these things that come in our mind, sometimes I think we think, that's just me. That's just, that's just how I'm wired. I've always been this way, and I'm always going to have these feelings, and I'm always going to feel less than. I'm always going to feel like I'm not good enough. I'm always going to feel like God's not working for me. He works for everybody else. I'm telling you, it's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. God's a good God. He takes prostitutes and makes them preachers. He, he, he's a good God. He wants to free you of those things. He wants you in rhythm to where you're enjoying jumping. Not feel like you trip every single day. I've been in times in my life where I felt like I've tripped every single day. Not lying. I just feel like I, I've told God before. I, I remember telling him going through this, this thing, this last thing I went through with my health. I said, God, I don't know if I'm ever going to get this faith thing right. I said, I feel like an EKG going up and down and up and down and up and down. And the Lord spoke to me. He's got a sense of humor. He said, at least you're not flatline. I said, yeah, I ain't done yet. <laughs> I guess I'll keep fighting another day. But it just, I felt like my faith was so inferior to other people's faith. I looked at Dr. John. I looked at Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagin and some of these, these heroes of the faith. And I think my faith's never going to be what their faith is. And God doesn't want my faith to be their faith. He wants it to be my faith. He wants me to own it. And no, at least I'm not flatlined. So it's not over yet. He wants to confuse us. He wants to control us so he can steal, kill, and destroy. He's like a roaring lion. What's a roaring lion do? He, he gets those that straggle. He gets those that's weak. He gets those that separate themselves from the body of Christ. That's what he does. He tries to come and, and, and get us 
He, he deals in intimidation. He looks for the loner. He looks for the one that's offended. He looks for the one that's hurting. He'll come at the hurting one. He said, he's seeking whom he may devour. I learned this from Rick Renner. If you don't have, Rick Renner has a book called Sparkling Gems 1 and 2. Have you ever seen it? It's worth getting. It's, it's, a, it's devotionals. But man, he's such a Greek scholar. But um, he, he says that word devour in the Greek, you know, there's, there's original Greek, there's biblical Greek, okay? Uh, and then there's natural Greek that's spoken. You know, he knows all three. <laughs> but, you know, here's the thing. He said that word devour means to drink or to slurp. It means there's no meat. He just comes in and just gets what's left. He wants to devour everything. He wants, when you're, on your, when you're on your last leg, he wants to come and devour you. He wants to, it, it implies that the devil wants to finish us off. He wants to finish us off. When we're weak, he wants to finish us off. He's not going to help us. He's not equal to God. He's a devil. He's a fallen angel, right? He can't take us out. That we resist him steadfast in the faith, and, and when we, that word steadfast means to reinforce yourself to get back in rhythm with God. When you resist him, you're getting back in rhythm with God and listening to what God says about you, what God says about the future. It goes with John 10 and 10. Okay? I love John 10 and 10 because it has such a dividing line in it. It says, the thief does not come. Y'all with me? I'll take a drink. I get excited and go fast. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Now, I've preached on this a lot of times. But one time when I was praying, I said, Lord, why is it still kill and destroy and not destroy or still um, destroy and then kill? Because I thought kill would be the final thing. And the Lord spoke this to my heart. He said, if the enemy can steal your seed, he can kill your harvest, and he can destroy your kingdom influence on this earth. So if he can, if he can come to any of you and he can steal your seed, he can kill your harvest, what you're to do on this earth, but he also comes to destroy anything after you. Like there's, so there's no memory of you on the earth. That's devour. He wants to lick up the blood. The thief, that word thief means bandit or scam artist. Anna used to watch Dora. How many have ever seen Dora the Explorer? Come on, don't leave me hanging. How many have seen Dora? Okay. Swiper, no swiper. Right? He's a scam artist. He's a fox. He's there. He's a bandit. He's, he's trying to swipe from us. That's, that's what a thief is. And he comes to steal the word steal there means klepto. He's, he's one so artful in the way he steals. He's like a pickpocket, relatively undetectable. He'll just come and start stealing. You know, I found out when I'm not in rhythm with God one day, it seems like the enemy knows it from my words. He does, and he comes and starts to pickpocket me. He comes to start to try to steal from me, take what he can. Are you with me? He, he's relatively undetectable. He, he doesn't come to your house and knock on the door with red horns and a pitchfork. Say, I'm the devil. I'm here to steal, kill, and destroy today. He doesn't come like that. He comes undetectable, and he comes like a pickpocket. You ever seen like a pickpocket on TV or in a movie or anything, how, how slick they are? What well, they do? They get somebody's attention over here, and then they steal from them. You know, there's some thieves are really good. And then there's those stupid thieves, you know, you see those shows, those stupid, dumb robbers or what, I don't know what it is, anyhow. But, but you see, the enemy, he's slick in stealing, that's, that's, that's his job. He comes to steal from you, and we'll think, he ain't stealing. He's not stealing from me. Huh? He, 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 he won't do that. He'll just sit there and say no while he's doing it. That's the devil. He'll say, you're in control, I'm not taking from you. You know what you're doing. You don't need God. You got this. Take it in your own hands. That's what he does. He's a klepto. 
He's, he's after anything you have. He wants to rob you blind. Anybody ever experienced this besides me? He does. We're going to get to the good part here. We're actually getting to the good part because we're being taught what not to let happen. Then he comes to kill. That word kill means sacrifice. It's not murder. Kill here doesn't mean murder. It means sacrifice what's left. In other words, he wants to get you so low that you just give up. That's, why, that's one of my key messages that I'm to preach the rest of my life is to stay anchored to Jesus and don't give up and how to stand. Because so many times I've experienced this, hopefully some of the life experience I got by now, hopefully I can help somebody else and be ready for the next one myself. But listen, that word kill means to sacrifice. He just wants you to give up what you got left and leave. I've been doing therapy and uh, just, just talking to a gentleman. And he, he went through a, a bad situation in a marriage. And he just, he just walked away and left everything. He just, just sacrificed what was left. He just wanted out. He just walked away. And that's what the devil wants us to do with our Christianity. He wants us just to walk away. It ain't working. It's no good. He wants to kill us. Well, without God, we're nothing. We're sunk. I'm sunk without God. I'm sunk without God. Does bad things happen? Yep, they still happen. Do I have tragedies? Sometimes, yeah. Do, hard things, do we go through hard things? Yeah. Do we have financial struggles? Yeah. Do we have uh, family struggles, relationship struggles? Yes, we do. But he wants to come. He wants us to get to the point where we just say, Uncle, take it. I'm done. Give up. Thank God you're here today. Thank God you're listening today on YouTube or Facebook because God's reaching out to you and saying, it's you, don't give up. I know you're tired. Rest if you must, but never quit. One of the best advice a preacher ever gave me and Sandy when we was young in ministry, rest if you must, but never quit. Don't quit. Yeah, there's times you got to push through. Amen. You know, when I went through COVID, I didn't feel like getting up. I knew I had to get up. I had to set the alarm to move every half hour. Didn't feel like getting up. Got to get up when you don't feel like it. Amen. You got to move when you don't feel like it. You got to go to therapy when you don't feel like it. Right? I go up there and they hurt me every week. They hurt me. Don't ask me how bad. They know they hurt me. When I walk in the next time... How, how, how bad were you? How long did you hurt? Well, about you did it about a day and a half this time. <laughs> or it lasted till today. I'm still hurting. Why is it hurt? Because you got to push past that, that place where your muscles tear and that muscle memory that's not there. I didn't move this stuff for years. Now I'm moving it. And you gotta, you got to tear past where you were to make new muscle. They told us lifting weights, man. When you bench press, I, I had this goal, man, one time. I was about 19 years old, and I had to get to 400 pounds bench press. I was working out with like 275. Man, I was doing, I was doing reps, and it's always that last rep. That's where the growth comes from. I can't even bench the bar anymore, just saying. But anyhow, I, 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 maybe, maybe I could. I don't know. But anyhow, listen, just listen. I would just push and push and push. But I had this buddy, Tommy T. He bench pressed 525. He knew what it was like to get through the 400 barrier. 400 is a barrier when you're lifting, when you got arms as long as I do. And, and, and so he knew how to push through. He knew where I needed to go, and he would make me struggle, dude. I'll tell you what. I know. It's, that's probably why I lost my hair, because all the veins on my head would be popping out, man. I was giving it everything I had to get that rep, and he would just... And, and, and sometimes, he was so strong that he could put one finger on it and be really lifting a lot, but he would act like he wasn't lifting. But he would just be torturing me on that last rep, is because that's where the growth comes. See... Nine I did by myself, or eight I did my, by myself. But, but man, the last one, it was all growth. 
And when you're going through a trial, you got to understand God's there. He's spotting you. Come on. He's spotting you. He says, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You just don't know it yet. I'm going to help you find it. I'm going to help you find your strength in the midst of your weakness. I'm going to help you find it, Jeff. I'm just going to just, come on. Come on. And we're down here going, yeah. Right? Oh. And he's helping us find our strength. He's not killing us. The devil wants to kill us. God wants us to know we can beat anything the devil throws at us. Woo! I got myself excited. Whew, I'm ready to lift weights. But listen, we, we got to know that he, he, listen, he comes to kill, he comes to tell us, I ain't lifting that no more. I'm done. I can't do it. Can't do it. Can't do it. But I've learned if you got enough of them, you can't do it. Next thing you know, that what you had was easy. It seemed like when I broke that working out with 275 barrier, man, I just, I, I went past a plateau. And once I did that, that was my mark. Right now, it's amazing. I can only move my legs so far in my mind because it's only ever moved so far. And they take my leg out. My wife says, I think your leg's going to break off. <laughs> I was like, never seen your leg move like that. It's like, does it hurt? No. Does it hurt? No. Does it hurt? No. Does it hurt? No. I was like, I might take Taekwondo again. You know, if somebody kicks me, I'm done now. But, but, but I'm like, but my mind says, no, it can't go there. But I can go there. I was made to go there. You know, you're being stopped, and you're trying to be being stopped by a place you're supposed to go. Yeah. The devil will come and try to stop us from going places we're supposed to go. Some of you fears kept you your whole life. Don't get to heaven and say, I should have, or know that you could have. I'd rather, I'd rather attempt walking on the water and sink like Peter did than to never get out the boat. Come on. The devil says, you get out of that boat, you know you're going to drown. You're sunk. What are we going to do now? You don't know how many times the devil's come to our house and said, how are you going to make it now? How are you going to do it? God can't get you through this time. He has, and he will, and he'll do it again. Say he'll do it again. Come on. Some of you are in a season you got to push. How many's in a season you got to push? You feel the weight. Your muscles are tearing. You think it'd be easier just to quit? It'd be easier just to say, enough of this. This is too hard. Oh, but God knows what you can do. See, the devil's trying to convince you to sacrifice what's left. God is trying to convince you to go on. Who's going to win? It's all between your ears. He's going to win. It, it's like he wants us to sacrifice the ashes when he's the one that gives us beauty for ashes. Okay? Does that make sense? It, listen, he, he don't want us to give up um, our precious dreams. He'll say there's no way to save it. Got to rewrite it. I didn't get the gun back that I sold I got the one back my daddy sold. Do you understand? I couldn't write it. There's no way to get it back. I got back in another way. It was better than what I thought I could get. If you look at Job, Job lost everything. Everything. It's miserable. He got back twice as much. That's the principle of God. That we get back twice. It's twice as good as what, however we could have made it. Whew. Hey, man, I'm so excited I could jump up and down. But listen, he comes to destroy. That word destroy means to trash, to literally undo, to obliterate, to wipe out, to destroy, to utterly blot out. I believe when one Christian stands in faith, even if they're all alone, they're standing for every Christian all over the world. I believe that's the way it works. You can say, what, what, what do I matter? You matter to every other Christian. You matter to me. You help keep me standing. I help keep you standing. If you quit, you affect a lot of people. If you grow, you affect a lot of people. Really. It's true. If you keep growing, you affect a lot of people. If you quit, you affect a lot of people. Either way. It's the way it works. But Jesus brings good news. You ready for the good news? I'm going to quit then. 
John 10 and 10, he says, but I have come to bring you life and life more abundant. That's the rhythm of God. The first thing we got to do to come to God is know he's a good God. He's not this, this God that's a hammer God that's ready to crush us the second we mess up. He's a good God. So number one, we got to change our mind about who God is. How many know he's a good God? He's full of joy. He's full of peace. He's got good thoughts about us. Do you know, I think we got worse thoughts about us than God has all the time. I believe that. Hebrews 11.6, I'm going to go through this quick, just, just to be, get through this. But Hebrews 11.6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Doesn't say he's going to make our life more miserable every day. He's a rewarder. If you're seeking him, he will reward you. Amen. Number two, when we repent and get born again, it means to change. Change our mind. We decide to live for God and according to his word instead of living according to our old nature. That's what happens. The first thing that's got to happen is we got to change our mind. Number three, repentance isn't a one-time deal. To have abundant life, it will happen over and over again. As we become like Christ, we change. Today, God wants us to change. Number four, getting in rhythm is walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. This is a hard one. We've got we to gotta walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. There's so many people got a hard time with walking in the spirit when it's just like jumping rope. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. I'm sure you all understand that, right? Then Romans 8, 13 and 14. It says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the spirit, if you if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. A change has to take place. We got to be quit quit being led by our flesh and be led by our spirit inside god's a spirit not a mind we contact him through the spirit our spirit needs to lead if you're born again you understand this is what i want to get to and then i'm going to quit uh the 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 fifth thing is we got to be filled with the fullness of god every day you got to be flooded with his spirit it's possible Ephesians 3, 14 to 19. He said, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, may, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. How many want filled with all the fullness of God? We want to be filled and overflowing, don't we? Ephesians 5.18. It says, Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. That word be filled means to be filled and then filled again. Filled and then filled again. How many of you know we leak? Then we get empty. Isn't it funny when you got a leak in something, how quick it goes empty? You know, whether it's a gas tank or a water tank or whatever it is, when you got a leak, it'll go empty. And that's the way we, we go through life and we leak every day. So we need filled continually again and again. So there's overflow to other people. The Holy Spirit in the Bible is represented by water many times. How many of you know that? The Holy Spirit is represented by water. Lot, we know it's represented by a dove. He's represented by a dove also, but he's represented by water. And, and so we could say that the water in the Bible is liquid God. We've got to be filled with liquid God. 
Amen. And we gotta, we got to believe in our heart, confess with our mouth. How many of you know you got to have your mouth open to drink? This don't work. You got to have your mouth open to drink. I believe you got to have your, be, have your mouth open speaking, praying, talking to God, letting His Spirit flow through you. That's why the devil wants us to keep our mouth shut, be depressed. John 7, Jesus said this. John 7, 37 to 39. It said, On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers. Say rivers. Rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Spirit, the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. How many of you know Jesus has been glorified? He's ascended. He's coming back. Now he's given us the Holy Spirit. And he, he, and he wants us, he said, he said, come unto me and drink, not think. Amen? We need more drinkers in church. I'm not talking about alcohol. We need more drinkers of the Holy Spirit instead of thinkers. We got too many thinkers and not enough drinkers. Our drinking should lead to thinking, like God. Right? And our thinking should lead to drinking, like Jesus said. So our drinking should lead to thinking, and our thinking should lead to drinking, and we should be drinking and thinking. Amen. It doesn't mean that we are not intellectual, it means we change who's leading. Everybody I've ever counseled has got a problem, and it's the problem they all have is unique. It's the problem I have. It's who they're being led by. I know that's simple counseling, but it's true. If you're led by your flesh, there's going to be problems. If you're led by the Spirit, there's going to be problems. But you're going to overcome if you're drinking instead of just thinking. Amen. you got to drink enough to where you can think straight. It's the opposite of the world. I know this probably get me in trouble. But it, the Bible says the natural man can't receive the things of God because he's a spirit. Jesus said, come unto me and drink. Drink. And then drink. Be filled with the spirit. He was speaking of the spirit that would to come. That's why Jesus said, why do we do firebrand? One reason we do firebrand is to get people drinking. This young generation drinking because they know a lot about thinking, but they don't know enough about drinking. They can't think straight because they don't drink right. Amen. Now, I know there's people that's given the Holy Spirit a bad name in churches that, that do, do flaky stuff. But I can tell you something. You will do unusual stuff if you're drinking. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Tell me how sometimes in one minute with God drinking his presence, he can change more than I've tried to change in five years in my own life. How does he do that? It's supernatural. How many have been changed by just being filled with the Holy Spirit? It's for everybody. It's for every believer. And again, it doesn't mean we're not intellectual. It means we make an adjustment of who we're being led by. We learn to drink and think. Honestly, if we're in rhythm with God, our drinking will lead to thinking. Smith Wigglesworth said this. He said, you can't get any closer to Jesus than you are yielded to the Holy Spirit. I think that's where we ought to end today. Let's all stand if we can. I think we got to have a plan to overcome. Amen. Submit to God. Resist the devil. And he will flee. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. If you're watching today or you're in here, how many of you are feeling the pain of that last rep that you're pushing and you feel like you can't do it, but, I, but you know today God's got it. You keep pushing because this is where the growth comes. This is where the growth comes in your life. The enemy wants you to give up. He wants you to quit. He wants you to lay it down. 
No. Don't do it. Don't do it. Push through. Push through. God's got it. You're not going to hurt yourself. Just push. <laughs> you'll be all right. You're not going to strain a muscle. You're going to gain muscle. You'll, you'll be all right. This is part of growth. I think we need to lead here, leave here yielded to the Holy Spirit. How many's thirsty? I'm thirsty. I want more. I want to flow with God in such a way, and I said this last time, this has been my prayer. I want to flow with God in such a way that when I reach out to somebody, it don't have to be up here in the pulpit, but when I speak to somebody or talk to somebody, I want it to be like Jesus speaking to them. I want it to get the words of life that come out of me in my daily life. And I, I just, I don't want to go through every day being bombarded by the enemy and feeling like I'm a loser. I want to be on that side that knows the mind of God by drinking. When he fills you with his spirit, it's good things. He's saying, you're my daughter. You're my son in whom I'm well pleased. Nobody will ever give you a pat on the back like God. Nobody will ever tell you you're doing a good job like God does. Nobody will ever tell you you can make it like God does. Any other voice is a lie. Because he's, he's, he's not only rooting for you, he's giving you the power to overcome to be what you need to be. Don't throw away your dreams and your hopes. Ask God for witty inventions, new ideas, that one thing that you need in your life. Maybe there's one key today that you need to overcome. Let it be today. Let's just yield to Him. Father, as we close today, we understand that we want to just walk yielded to You. God, give us ears to hear what the Spirit's saying to us this morning. God, I pray that we can live our lives in rhythm with you as we go into the Christmas season. And, and we know it's, I've seen a sign that said it's not just about the presence, it's about your presence, meaning your presence among us and in us. And God, we pray your Spirit would flow through us today. I pray, God, for people who has been been in that place of resistance. You've been fighting and you're tired and you're ready to give up and the enemy's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. I pray that today enough is enough. We submit to you, God. We resist the devil and he has to flee. And I declare that you're not only going to make it, you're going to be stronger through this and help other people. And I believe this is a time of harvest and you're going to help harvest many souls into the kingdom and souls into this church right here at the Anchor. God, we thank you and we praise you today for loving us like a good father. And we give, we give you praise. Can we all just take a moment from our hearts and praise him for being a good God? Father, we thank you and we praise you for being a good God, for being with us and being in us. Whew. Somebody needs to hear this today. God has not forgotten about you. God has not forgotten you. God sees you. God's with you. God's for you today. Father, we thank you. And we praise you for it. God, we go out of here just desiring and longing to be in rhythm with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all on live stream, Facebook, YouTube.